So as I've been doing research into Skylanders as a whole, I think one of the best things that this franchise has ever done was the elements. Every single element manages to stick out in their own special way and have some sort of weight when it comes to the Skylanders themselves. No matter their design, their style, or their species, they still are able to be centered around their element. So as I was doing research into the next Skylanders video, I decided that hey, why not make a video on one specific element again? And after doing a little bit of research, I would find this guy right here. Diveclops, and his history and backstory was just so fascinating to me that I just had to talk about it. But the thing is, it wasn't long enough to be its own video, so I decided to pair them up with two other Skylanders of the Water Element, which is exactly what we're going to do today. We're going to take a look at some other Skylanders from the Water Element, along with the guy that I just talked about earlier. And to make life easier, let's start things off with him first. Look out for now, when it came to Dive Clops, I really thought that he was going to have a basic background and not much else, but he had one detail about him that made me interested in him immediately. And what's even crazier is that his entire backstory is actually shown in a comic book. So to delay my thoughts a little bit and get some screenshots, let's take a look at his development history and see what we can find. Now, interestingly enough, Diveclops was supposed to be a fish inside of a suit for some reason, and he was switched to an eyeball instead, and I don't exactly know why. I did try to check the link to the YouTube video in the wiki to see if I could find any clues there, but the video doesn't exist anymore. But with that out the way, let's jump into his backstory and see what we can learn. Before Diveclops was a Skylander, he used to be a normal flying eyeball, and during his childhood, he and his twin brother would be inseparable. And if you're wondering who his brother was, it's Eyebrawl. Yes, the eye part of Eyebrawl and Diveclops are actually brothers. But one day, while he was flying above one of Skyland's many seas by himself, he would stray too close to a pirate ship, and seeing the flying eyeball that could barely do anything to them, they would shoot him out of the sky with a cannonball, blowing off his wings and sending him plummeting into the swirling sea below. Crippled and stuck at the bottom of the ocean, he would roll across the ocean floor for days until he was found by jelly dwarves and taken back to their castle. And once they did, they would get to work on building a suit for him, which he used to wander the depths of the ocean before one day, while he was exploring the whirlpool of destiny, he would get too close to it and get sucked into it. Thousands of years later, Diveclops was spit out of the whirlpool, learning how far forward in time he was sent before eventually coming across Eon, who offered him to be a Skylander like his brother was, and he would go on to become a special Skylander as well, a supercharger, and he would make an appearance in Ripped into Overdrive and another book called Dive Dive Dive, which I can't really cover right now since I'm having trouble finding it and I'm crunching to get this done, so whenever I do eyebrawl, I'll make sure to cover that story. Now, the biggest thing that I noticed about this backstory is how it fluctuated between the sources I was using because some iterations of the story would have the jelly dwarves make the suit for him, while others imply that he was just given the suit. But for that one specifically, it's Eon's retelling of the whole story from the Superchargers guidebook, and after I figured that out, that's when I began to wonder... Who actually wrote down these backstories in-universe? Is it the Skylanders themselves documenting these stories, or is it someone else? Because they're always written in a way like they're being told to you as a story. And we've already seen through the guidebooks that Eon explains the story differently, so it has to be someone else. Another thing that I wanted to ask is, why did the Jelly Dwarves help him? Yeah, I know it mentions that they were fascinated by his appearance, so maybe they felt bad, but it doesn't really explain it for me. Especially since they went out of their way to bring them into their castle and from what I could guess from the panel in the comic, they all worked together to make his suit. From my guess, the Jelly Dwarves probably just felt bad and made it for him out of kindness. So with that out the way, let's get into the next Skylander of today. Now, when it comes to Skylanders, I originally thought that Riptide was going to be one of those Skylanders that I didn't have to do that much digging into. But never was I more wrong. This is the first time that I've had to go to more than three sources just to find something. And I had to look at six just to confirm the character development section of the wiki. So with that out of the way, let's actually take a look at his development because this is probably the most interesting one that I have ever looked at. Apparently, Riptide was the first Skylander created for SWAT Force, and it's not because he was the first designed, but because he was the first shapeshifter and went by the name of Kraken, which was supposed to be the gimmick for Swap Force before it was swapped out with, well, the Swap gimmick. 
and interestingly enough, Kraken was in the pitch for Skylander Shapeshifters alongside Aftershock and Breezewing, two other scrap Skylanders. After Kraken was game tested, his bubble move ended up being too confusing for the kid game testers and he was brought back to the drawing board, Kraken being scrapped and his remnants becoming a swap for Skylander who went by the name of Bubble Trouble, who was a frog-like warrior. And this is where pieces of Riptide would begin to spring up as well, like his sword and pieces of his armor. Unfortunately, the changes that they made for Bubble Trouble just made him more confusing in the long run, and since Freeze Blade and Washbuckler were already approved to be the Water Skylanders, Vicarious Visions decided to turn him into a Core Skylander and gave some of his ashes that were in the form of attacks to Washbuckler and Shockpunk. His name would then be changed to Riptide, where he would go through even more designs before the designers stuck to the one that we have now. And according to Dan Wallace, who was one of the developers, Riptide took three times the time and pain of a normal Skylander but he sparked ideas for three other coolest characters. So with all of that said and done, let's take a look at his backstory and see what we can learn. Before Riptide was a Skylander, he was once known far and wide as one of the best Aqua Fighters in all of Skylands, mastering a multitude of water techniques and astonishing tournament spectators with his ability to adapt his fighting style to any opponent. More of his well-known skills being his Swordfish Fencing, Hammerhead Heaving, and even the rare Blubber Whale Wallop, which he used regularly in the legendary Rumble in the Reef. Soon enough, his unrivaled skills in Swordsmanship would get the attention of Master Eon, and this is usually where stories like this would end, but unbeknownst to the two, Chaos would get wind of this and decide that he was going to put an anchor-sized hole in the operation. Chaos would send out a legion of squid-faced brutes to stop him, but everyone remembered what happened next, except for the brutes because Riptide gave them CTE so bad that they didn't remember what happened. Good god, and Riptide would go on to join the Skylanders from there. Now, the biggest question that I have with Riptide isn't actually with his story, but with the attacks he uses, because, uh... Does he have the power of Toon Force on his side? Like, this isn't a lot of the other Skylanders summoning animals to fight for them. He is literally pulling whales out of his back pocket to beat people with. Like, I'm being dead serious, where the hell did he get this thing from? And speaking of beating people, I wonder what the Rumble in the Reef actually was. It sounds like a really cool location and I'd love for it to be expanded upon. But with that out of the way, let's get into the final Skylander of today. Now, I was really going to make this section about Tidepool, but while I was stumbling through Riptide's history, I would learn about Punk Shock. And since another subscriber gave me another idea for a group of Skylanders I could talk about, and I was doing research into Punk Shock at the time, I realized that there was way more stuff going on here than I originally thought. So without any more stalling, let's get straight into her development history. Apparently, earlier in her development, Punk Shock was actually supposed to be a guy and use a fishing rod, along with an electric tongue to attack enemies. But as things went along, they would eventually make her a girl, and she would go through a ton of designs from there before eventually sticking to the one that we got in-game. But with that out the way, let's actually take a look at her backstory and see what we can find. Before she was a Skylander, Punk Shock was the daughter of one of the most royal families in the Wondrous Waters, but she really didn't accept her role as an underwater princess and instead sought out a more exciting life. She would much rather go out and explore, hunting with her electric bow and listening to supercharged music, but one day she would go out to the outer reaches of her kingdom to find an adventure. But when she got back, she would find that her entire kingdom had been frozen by a group of snow trolls, who were there to steal the kingdom's valuable treasure. But when she figured this out, she would use her crossbow to handily defeat the snow trolls and unfreeze her kingdom. And apparently, Gilgore just has a talent for finding Skylanders because he would somehow hear about this incident, and once he found her, he would make an offer to her to become a Skylander. And probably seeing the life and adventure that awaited her, she would take up his offer and become one. If I had a quarter every time Gilgrunt recruited the Skylander into the organization, I would have about a dollar, and that's because of the two times some location was frozen and assumed to be Skylander unfrozen. Now, what's interesting about Punk Shock and her backstory is the fact that Punk Shock is another princess from another water kingdom. Which makes me wonder how many of them there actually are within Skylands, because at this point I've seen like three, and that's assuming Echo and Zap come from the same place. Also, another thing that I've been wondering is what does her family think of her being a Skylander? Now, I took a look around her appearances in each of the guidebooks in the archives, and unfortunately I wasn't able to find anything. So for now, this is just once again another one of those cold cases. No pun intended. But with that out the way, thank you for watching. Like always, hit the subscribe button if you enjoy content like this, share this around so I can grow as a channel, leave some comments down below to make the algorithm happy, and I will see you all in the next one.